Okay, so here we are, part two. Um, we're going to do this over in one note, see if we have any better luck. Um, so, plus really the cool thing about one note that I can do is... Here, let's go. Because we're in space... Yo, so a couple things happened um, while I was up or like rendering the other video. I noticed two things. Um, the first that I said that the equation for or the units for velocity were kilogram meters per second, and that is incorrect. Those are my those are our units for momentum. Um, what was the second thing I noticed? Oh, uh, someone, my dog, heard herself whining on the uh, paper. She got really interested. I thought that was funny. Okay, so here we have Angie. 85 kilograms. And then here we have... Our satellite at 800 kilograms. Now we already figured out um, that the equation we're going to use rendered us with both objects having zero initial. Uh, momentum. And again, this is important to know because we know that it is equal. So we start off with zero momentum. We need to end with zero momentum. Now, there are two ways to have zero momentum. The first is to have nothing moving. The second is to have the things moving in opposite directions to where their momentum is equal to each other. So, we have zero over here, because nothing was moving, and then we're going to grab our handy-dandy calculator, my vacuum is trying to vacuum up my entire house, 85 times, oh, no, that's not right. Negative 1.8. Yeah, that sounds about right. Negative 153 kilogram meters per second. We still just have 800 kilogram times X meters per second over here. So, algebra, ladies and gents, and non binaries. So we're going to add 153 momentum units, kilogram meters per second to both sides. And that gives us 153 kilogram meters per second equals 800 kilogram meters per second. And divide both sides then by 800 kilograms. Notice unit-wise, this gives us meters per second over here, which is good because that's x meters per second. And we go 153 divided by 800, and we get 0.19125. Now, because I'm a stickler for um, sig figs, we look to see how many we have. We have two here, two here, and... 800 kilograms has one sig fig. It's only the eight. So one is all we get. So this is going to be 0.2 meters per second. And that should make sense. Um, you know, we have negative 1.8 meters per second is how fast Angie's moving as she pushes off the satellite. And the satellite's a little bit under 10 times as big. 
So it's going to be going roughly 10 times slower. Um, and that tracks. So let's go on to number three. What is the difference in gravitational force between two 10 kilogram masses when they are one meter apart and then five meters apart? So gravitational force. Force of gravity equals gravitational constant times m1 times m2 over r squared, where r is the distance uh, between the two objects. Uh, now, if we are, it's, it's also radius. Um, so if we are looking at... Um, a planet, it's the radius of the planet, but when we just have two objects like this, it is simply just the distance between them. So we have two, we have two things here. We know both of the, we know mass one equals 10 kilograms, mass two equals 10 kilograms, and then we have two different R's. We have R sub one, we're gonna call that, and that's one meter, Then we have R sub 2, which is 5 meters. Okay. So over here we have force of gravity equals 6.67 6, e to the negative 11th. And remember, that's a Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And we're going to multiply that by 100 kilograms squared and one meter squared. So those cancel out and lo and behold, we end up with Newtons, which is good because that's kind of the purpose of the gravitational constant. Um, so here the force of gravity between the two would be 6.67 um, e to the negative ninth. Uh, 100 divided by one is 100, 100 times that just moves the decimal plate point two places, so we just make it a hundred times bigger. Um, F sub G sub two, so this is sub one, equals that same gravitational constant. Times our masses haven't changed, but our radius has, so it's five squared there. So we're going to do 25 meters squared. 6.67. So we ended up just kind of multiplying by 4 is what's going to happen. That's going to give us 2... Well, that doesn't seem right. 6.6743... Oh, that's right, because I did it to that. I forgot to put the negative. There we go. 2.7 e to the negative 10th. Um, so it asks what the difference in the gravitational force is. Um, so then we would subtract these two. Um, we want to subtract the smaller one from the bigger one. So we go 6.67 e to the negative 9th minus... 2.7 e to the negative tenth, and that gives us 6.4 e to the negative ninth newtons is the difference in gravitational pull. Uh, basically, we just figured out what the gravitational pull between them was at a meter and five meters. Clearly, it's going to be stronger at one meter than it is at five meters. 
Um, and that just shows you how big of a impact distance can have. So moving along, number four. Uh, and then as you go shopping and are racing to put groceries in the back of the car, in order to do so, they must race each bag of groceries, which each have a mass of four kilograms, a height of 1.5 meters. It takes Andy two seconds to do this and Angie 1.4 seconds. Determine the work and power exerted by both in lifting their bags. So here's the thing. I know work equals force times distance. Force here is going to be mass times acceleration due to gravity. I know power equals work uh, divided by time. So the shorter something is, the more power it took to do it. The longer something is, the less power. So, um, let's figure out the work. Here's the thing. Work has no indication of time. Uh, so, it doesn't matter. So, they both do the same amount of work in lifting a four kilogram bag 1.5 meters up. Now notice what we're going to get here. We're going to get kilogram meters squared per second squared or a joule. Which is good because work is a form of energy. And so we should be getting joules. So we go 4 times 9.81. That's 39.24. That's the number of newtons it takes uh, to lift a 4 kilogram bag against gravity and then we multiply that by uh, 1.5 meters we get 58.86 joules um, or more accurately because they're only um, four kilograms we only get one sig fig here so the work done by both is 60 joules okay so now we're going to look at power power of andy is that 60 joules divided by two seconds and that is going to be 30 joules per second or watts Angie also is using 60 joules of energy or working 60 joules but she's doing it in 1.4 seconds so notice that because she does it quicker she ends up with it's 42.8. Um, but again, because we only have one sig fig there, that would just be 40 watts. So we would run it down. Um, so she does it half a second quicker and is using an extra 10 watts of power uh, to make that happen quicker. Okay, Angie decides to go ice skating. If her kinetic energy is 1650 joules, we're skating at 8 meters per second. What is her speed if her kinetic energy is 1800 joules? Okay, so here's the thing. We know the equation for kinetic energy is 1 half mass times velocity squared. Um, so if we know that she has her kinetic energy is 1650 joules, we don't know her mass, but we know her velocity is 8 meters per second. What we can do is we can figure out her mass. So then over here, we can go 1,800 joules equals 1 half times this mass that we find right here 
times her velocity squared. So this equation ultimately is going to look like this. And there we go. So once we find the mass, we just divide 3,600 joules by that mass, take the square root, and that's going to be our speed of Angie um, with the heightened kinetic energy. So this is 16. 50 joules equals 8 times 8 is 64 divided by 2 is 32 meters squared per second squared. Still no word on mass, right? Divide this by 32 meters squared per second squared. Now remember, joules are kilogram meters squared per second squared. So if I'm dividing that by meters squared per second squared, all we have left is kilograms, which is good because when we do this, we should end up with a mass unit. So we divide that 32 or 1650 by 32. We get 51.5625. Again, we look around for sig figs. Um, and we see that 8 meters per second. Um, so we go 50. Kilograms is her mass. So we're going to go over here. We're going to have V equals the square root 3,600 joules divided by 50 kilograms. And notice here, because joules is kilogram meters squared per second squared. So when we divide by kilograms, we end up with meters squared per second squared. We then square root that, we end up with meters per second, which since we're looking for velocity here, um, our speed is a good thing. So we've got 3,600 divided by 50 gives me 72. We're going to square root that. And the speed is approximately 8.5 meters per second. Um, and again, because we only have one sig fig that try, chases us through the whole problem. Alrighty. Okay. So, uh, the box has finally run away, guys. Um, it's tired of being pushed. And, uh, you know, uh, Angie and Andy are a little more busy lately. So they just don't have time to, you know, spend with good old box. So, it's weight... is 1.3 newtons. When we talk about weight, we're talking about pushing against how much force it takes to, you know, move it away from the earth. So the system we normally use is pounds here, um, but it is a force measurement. It's how hard does I just completely lost my train of thought. Ah, uh, because I'm tired. I'm not making sense. Um, so it goes around the curve. Oh, so wait, right. So um, when we when it gives a weight of 1.3 newtons, the first thing we need to do realize that force equals mass times acceleration. Force or gravity is mass times gravity. So we're going to actually divide by A, which is 9.81. So we have 1.3 newtons. 
We're going to divide that by acceleration. Do the Earth. Um, so we go 1.3 divided by 9.81, and we get mass of 0.13 kilograms. Uh, that's 130 newtons. So that would be 1.3 kilograms, I'm assuming. 30 newtons divided by 9.81. Uh, 13.25. Sorry about that. Um, so 130 divided by 9.81 is 13.3 kilograms. Or we only get two sig figs here, so 13 kilograms. Um, so it's traveling at 32 kilometers an hour. And it goes around a curb. And the centripetal force acting upon it is, um, we don't know. So we're looking for this. Um, so the diameter of this circle is 2.4 kilometers, uh, which means its radius is 1.2 kilometers, um, which because we're using newtons and stuff like that, multiply by a thousand, we get 1,200 meters. Um, likewise, if we know the box is traveling at 32 kilometers per hour, um, and that's the conversion right there. So we go 32 times a thousand divided by 3600. And we get okay, just a second. Okay, and we're back, and so that takes us to 8.88 .88 meters per second. Um, you need to make sure you're always dealing in the same units, okay? So... We know that the equation for centripetal force equals mass times acceleration. So we have the mass right there. Then the acceleration is VT squared over radius, right? So that's going to give us the centripetal force equals MVT squared over R. Now, Keep in mind here, the radius is 1,200 meters. We already went over that. Cool. So, triple force equals mass. So, that is 13 oh, box um, 13 kilograms. Speed, 8.88, or 8.88 yeah, meters per second, all over radius of 1,200 meters. So, calculator, we're going to go 13 times 8.88 squared, 78.8, and that gives us 1,025. We're going to divide that by 1,200 meters. 
Um, and that's going to give us 0.85 newtons. See? And my dog's yelling again, so be right back. Okay. Next up. Um, this is by far going to be the most difficult. Um, I think one, maybe two people got the coefficient of kinetic friction right. So, um, so uh, Angie and Andy have decided to play bumper cars with Zambonis. Let's draw a picture. Zambonis are the big things that they use to reset the ice. After, um, you know, ice skating and uh, hockey and stuff like that. So, Angie Zamboni has a mass of 1,300 kilograms and is traveling at 12.0 meters per second east. And Andy's. I know this is like the greatest Zamboni drawing ever. Is bigger for some reason. Not for some reason, just because it makes the problem more interesting. And this is traveling at 8.00 meters per second to the west. So. They collide, stick together, and slide to a stop over a course of 12 meters. Determine the following. So, velocity, kinetic energy, and then coefficient of kinetic friction. So, let's do this. A velocity. They stick together. So, this is a perfectly inelastic collision. So, this is our equation. And we need to find the velocity right there. Again, super important that we add directionality into our equation. We do that by adding the negative there. Okay, so we're going to go 1,300 times 12. It's 15,600 kilogram meters per second. And then... Um, 1800 times negative 8 gives us negative 14,400 kilogram meters per second. And that's going to add up to 3,100 kilograms times our final velocity. 15,600 minus 14,400 is 1,200 kilogram meters per second uh, we're going to divide by 3100 kilograms which is the combined mass of both of them hey and that's going to give us 1200 
We're going to divide that by 3,100. Gives us 0.38. Okay, how many sig figs do we get here? 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Point three eight seven meters per second. Notice that's a positive number, so we know that's going to the right. So that's our final velocity. Okay. Now, so that's part A. B, loss of kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy looks like this. So what we do, we know the change in kinetic energy equals the kinetic energy we end up with minus the kinetic energy we started with. The kinetic energy we end up with is one half. So remember, kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. Nope, that's not a squared. Let's sub two. Okay, so one half mv squared. So the kinetic energy we end up with is the total mass of both Zambonis, 3,100 kilograms, times its speed, 0.387 meters per second squared. So if I drop that into a calculator, it's going to go 0.5 times 3,100 times 0.387 squared. And that's going to give me 232 joules. Now I'm subtracting from that, the kinetic energy we end up with is the combination of both Zamboni's kinetic energies. So we have the kinetic energy of Angie's Zamboni, which was 1,300 kilograms traveling at... 12 meters per second. And then we have Andes, which was 1,800 kilograms, traveling at 8 meters per second. Now notice what happens here. Because we're squaring the velocity, it's going to become positive. Just drop it into our calculator. So 0.5 times 1300 times 144. So that was 93,600 joules. Plus the kinetic energy of Andes. Um, so we go 1 half times 1800 times 64. So that's 57,600 joules. So we end up with 232 joules. When we started off with the entire system having One hundred and fifty one thousand two hundred joules. So we go two thirty two minus one fifty one two hundred, and we get a loss of one hundred and fifty thousand nine hundred and sixty eight joules. Now, this was another problem that a lot of you guys had. A lot of you guys would put that down as the answer for lost joules. The problem with that is, is we only have three sig figs. So we lost 151,000 joules because we go 1, 2, 3, 
and that 9 rounds that 0 up to a 1. Or we can go negative 1.51 e to the 5th joules or negative 1.51 times 10 to the 5th joules. Either one of those is acceptable. So, now is the tough part. Any of those three answers would be fine because all three of those have um, three sig figs and the correct um, units. Now, kinetic energy. We know that the coefficient of kinetic friction is the force of kinetic energy over normal force. Okay? Normal force, in this case, is going to be 3,100 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared Thirty one hundred kilograms, of course, being the combined mass of the two Zamponis, nine point eight one meters per second squared being acceleration due to gravity. So once we figured out the force of kinetic friction, we're going to divide that by the normal force of thirty thousand four hundred and eleven newtons, um, and that'll give us our coefficient of kinetic friction. So how are we going to figure out the force of kinetic friction? And this takes a bit of thought, and it's something we have gone over. We know that work is force times distance. So the force of kinetic friction is the work done by friction divided by the distance done. Well, how much work did friction do? Well, when the... Zambonis collide and start moving, they have a total energy of 232 joules, which means that the work that friction did was it stopped that. And, and think about it this way. If I roll a ball on the ground, it doesn't keep going forever. It stops. And the reason it stops is because friction takes away that energy. The work that friction did is equal to the energy it started with. So in this case, that's negative 232 joules. We figure out that it took 12 meters to stop. So the force of kinetic friction in this case, 232 divided by 12.0 meters is 19.3 newtons. Again, remember joules are kilogram meters squared per second squared. If we divide that by meters, we get kilogram meters per second squared, which is newtons. Okay. So we take this 19.3, plug it in there. Divide by 30,411 newtons. Notice the newtons cancel out. So we have 19.3 divided by 30,411. And we get 0. 0.000635. Um, it's 63, actually, 46. Uh, but we only get three sig figs here. So that 6 is going to round up. So what we end up with is our coefficient of kinetic friction equaling 6.35 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's it. Or we can go 6.35 e to the negative fourth. Now, here's the thing. Um, there were a lot of people who would end up putting units on uh, the coefficient of kinetic friction. But as you can see here, if I'm dividing kinetic, the force of kinetic friction, which is going to be in newtons, over normal force, which is also going to be in newtons, newtons cancel out. 
which means we have no units. Coefficient of static and kinetic friction have no units attached to them. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, if not, uh, come see me before your final on Thursday. Um, or email me or whatever you need. And thank you all very much. And I hope you guys were all really super well behaved for the sub.